Well, I think it is recording. I don't know if you need to accept. Um, but my name is Mike Bingle Davis. I'm current president of the Energy Minerals Division of the American Association of Petroleum Geology. And uh, we're all very lucky to have Jack Farchi with us today. Um, he's the author of a book, The World for Sale. Uh, he will be introducing himself. I look for a biography. It should be easy to find, but uh, I figured it'd be better for him to introduce you know, himself. The way questions are going to be handled is if you have a question, you can either put it in chat or uh, raise your hand and hopefully we see it. And then we will unmute you or you can unmute yourself and ask the question. I think that makes sense. Um, with that, I'll leave it. I'll leave that as it is uh, real quick. And I'll turn it over to Susan to introduce herself. She's the co-host and then give it to Jack. So thank you for coming. Hi there, I'm Susan Nash, AAPG. I'm Director of Innovation, Emerging Science and Technology. But I have to say that this, um, this topic really it intrigues me because um, as, as I diversified from with geology, I was uh, an international operations analyst as a developmental e economist and for uh, Kermigi Chemical, now we, we had mines, but we also created and, and did critical strategic chemicals like uranium, depleted uranium hexafluoride and ammonium perchlorate. And so it was interesting to me to see some of the things that Jack will be talking about in action. And also um, I worked on the marketing side. So it was interesting to see where our products ended up. Um, so at any rate and why and how things happened and the role of some of these brokers so really feel fortunate and I just want to give a big plug to the energy minerals division, Mike's the president. And this is a, a first for the energy minerals division to have this type of, of open book discussion of ideas. So wonderful and, and thank you. Uh, should I say a few words about uh, myself? Um, yes. I think you know I'm the, the co-author of The World for Sale with Javier Blas. Uh, who can't be here today, I'm afraid he's, no, I think he's on his way back from Singapore at the moment. Um, uh, I am a journalist at Bloomberg News. I write about commodity and uh, commodities and energy, um, covering everything from the big companies, the likes of ExxonMobil or BHP Billiton, through to the trading houses like Vito, Glencore, Cargill, and also the markets themselves, what's happening in the oil market, the gas market, the metals markets, uh, and so forth and so on. Um, I've been a journalist at Bloomberg uh, for coming up for six years now. Uh, before that, I worked at the Financial Times. I was the FT's uh, correspondent in London covering commodities for a number of years. And I moved to Moscow and I spent three years in Moscow as the Russia and Central Asia correspondent, uh, before which I moved back to, to London uh, with Bloomberg. Uh, I can say a few words. I don't know if, uh, if all of you will have read the book. So just to, to set the scene a little bit of what the book is about. Uh, it tells the story of the commodity traders um, really in the last 75 years or so, the period from the end of the Second World War until today. Uh, and really the reason we set out to write the book is Javier and I, we've both been journalists writing about commodity markets. Um, and, and we felt that commodity traders, and by commodity traders, I really mean the, the independent trading houses, the likes of Fetal, Glencore, Cargill, um, people like that, uh, were both fascinating and also enormously important. Uh, and that the world outside of the commodities industry, but even within the commodities industry, actually, people didn't really know nearly as much as they could do and perhaps should do about, uh, about this industry. Um, you know, we saw as journalists writing about the markets, but also about geopolitics, about economics, uh, the crucial role that commodity traders were playing uh, in everything from who had the best insight into the into a particular market uh, and what the price of oil was going to do the next week, through to sometimes having influence over that, through to uh, bailing out countries and governments or deciding who was going to be uh, which governments were going to be successful or or who was going to win or lose a war. Uh, and we felt that 
you know, from we, we started this this kind of idea of writing a book about commodity traders when we were working but together at the FT, uh, and we 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 saw that around the newsroom, our colleagues, uh, journalists who were fairly kind of well read and and news literate people, almost none of them had ever heard of uh, even the biggest commodity traders, and they certainly didn't know anything about them. And we felt that this was a story that deserved to be told and that the world should know more about it. So we we set out to write this book and the story really of how the commodity trading industry grew from the period after the Second World War, where it was a relatively small thing to becoming this really important part of the global economy today. Um, and there are a few big changes and shifts in uh, in the way the world works that, that made that possible. Uh, I think probably the single biggest one is the liberalization of the oil market. Uh, so the... Um, the formation of OPEC, the nationalization of oil resources in the Middle East, uh, in Latin America in the 1960s and 70s. And that took the oil market from something that was controlled by a few big uh, Western companies, uh, all the way from oil oil field to uh, refinery through to filling station. Suddenly, uh, the, the, the governments of um, OPEC countries controlled the oil resources and they needed somebody to sell them, to, to, to sell it. And the person who came in and sold it was commodity traders in the first instance, Mark Rich, and then lots of others. Uh, and that created the oil market and created uh, a role for the commodity traders in what became the world's most important commodity market uh, and really drove a lot of their growth. Uh, the other things that we highlight in the book, um, the collapse of the Soviet Union, which opened up uh, a huge new producer of, well, not new, but a huge producer of commodities that was previously sealed off from uh, the rest of the world markets or almost sealed off from the rest of the world markets and opened it up uh, in a free for all that was enormously uh, beneficial to some commodity traders. Uh, and the other one is the rise of China since, you know, this this century, uh, which has driven, uh, as I think probably everyone on this call knows, uh, a big bull market across all commodities uh, that has been that has made commodity traders both wealthy, but also made them important, in, in, incredibly important. Uh, strategically as suppliers of the commodities that have been in short supply. Um, the final big thing that's changed is the availability of financing. So, you know, we talked to some commodity traders who were active in, I think the the oldest person we interviewed uh, had started his career in the 1950s at Philip Brothers. Uh, and back in those days, there was very little finance available to trade commodities, in part because many commodities weren't traded on exchanges. Uh, metals were, grains were, but energy was not. Um, and even in the metals and, and, and grains market, there were large bits of the market that, that didn't use exchange pricing. Uh, in the 1980s and even more so in the 1990s and 2000s, a lot more finance has become available. And so commodity traders can trade much larger volume, uh, hedge it on an exchange, finance it uh, without needing all of their own capital in order to to pay for the entire value of a cargo of oil or metals or whatever it might be. Uh, and so that, that's enabled them to become an awful lot larger uh, much more quickly than was true before this kind of financialization of the markets uh, beginning in the 1980s. So you put all those things together and the commodity traders become large and important. Uh, I mean, just to give you a few uh, a few stats uh, that, that demonstrates how significant they are. Um, in in the oil market, for example, the five largest commodity traders handle about 25 million barrels a day uh, of oil, which is equivalent to about a quarter of the of global demand. Um, the biggest seven grain traders uh, trade about half of the internationally traded grain. Um, if you look at uh, the three largest commodity traders, that's Glencore, Vitol, and Cargill. Uh, in the in the decade to 2011, they collectively had bigger profits than either Apple or Coca-Cola. Uh, and the four largest commodity traders, uh, if you put together their revenues, it's bigger than the total exports of Japan. So these are big companies. They're largely unknown. They're mostly privately owned uh, and they're very important. Uh, I've, I've probably said enough for an introduction, so I'll turn it over to Mike, perhaps, for a question. Right. Uh one of my first questions, or, and thank you for that. Thank you for the introduction. It's an amazing book. Um, right now, Glencore is actually going under some scrutiny, right? 
They oh, certainly are. Yeah. <laughs> Something about they've had, a, they've had quite a series of uh, of corruption cases in and market manipulation in in the US and the UK and Brazil and I think there's at least a couple more to come in Switzerland and the Netherlands. And do you think that's something that will actually bear fruit or more than likely be kind of brushed aside? What do you mean by bear fruit? Uh, you know, when often when these companies are I don't want to say too big to fail, but where they get brought up on charges. Um, get found guilty, and then sort of, I guess what comes to mind is the recent uh, cryptocurrency uh, debacle that happened where, you know, the, the individual that was sort of moving those crypto uh, assets may or may not, uh, you know, be brought up on charges for things like that, um, essentially getting away with it. I don't know if that's really a <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you could say that Glencore, I don't think you could say that Glencore has totally got away with it because they will have paid one and a half billion dollars in fines uh, and pleaded guilty to uh, corruption and market manipulation. Uh, and there are still cases outstanding and there's still the possibility of um, of charges against a number of individuals. I mean, the SFO in the UK has said that there's 11 individuals, former Glencore employees, who they are looking at and might charge between now and April next year. So I don't think that's quite getting away with it. Um, I do think you could make the argument that one and a half billion dollars is relatively cheap for Glencore. Um, you know, it's a company that's going to make profits in probably the tens of billions of dollars this year. Uh, one and a half billion is uh, is a few a few weeks profit. Um, so on that basis. It's relatively cheap. I mean, if you look at the if you look at the the fine that Vitol paid, Vitol, um, the largest oil trader, settled uh, with the U.S. Uh, over corruption allegations again in three Latin American countries uh, back at the end of 2020, and they paid about 160 million dollars in total, which is even smaller as a fine relative to their profits, which again are kind of tend to be three four billion dollars a year. Uh, I think this year it's going to be significantly more. Uh, so 160 million dollars is uh, is a pretty small number for for these kind of companies. So I mean, on the one hand, uh, there have been many years in which uh, these companies have gone without uh, any investigations into them or prosecution of wrongdoing. Um, where now we learn, thanks to these these uh, these investigations that have come out, that they were doing lots of bad things. So uh, so the fact that these cases have been brought and they've been you know, found guilty and pled guilty is, I think, progress. Uh, whether that will end corruption in the commodity trading industry? Well, I think we can probably say with 100 percent certainty it won't totally end commodity corruption in the commodity trading industry. Uh, but I do think things are changing bit by bit. Um, it becomes harder and harder and harder to be corrupt uh, in the same ways that commodity traders were maybe 50 years ago. Um, that said, you know, I was just reading the SFO, uh, the SFO statement of facts in the case against Glencore, and there were traders at Glencore flying across Africa with private jets full of cash um, back a, a, as recently as, you know, the mid 2010s. Um, so we'll see. We'll see. And I wanted to thank you. Uh, I wanted to follow that up with. Um... And this, this is kind of a general question, but it's not even really a question. What would you consider to be the, I don't want to, I don't know how to phrase it, the, the craziest story in the book that you could summarize for the people that are in the room? I know having read sure. it, there's some, there, it's continuous. There's all kinds of amazing stories. So, uh, well, yeah, it was, a, it was a fun experience um, researching it and, and uncovering some of these stories. Um, I mean, I think a story which is the story the book opens with, and so it'll be familiar to some of you, but uh, that really brings home to me the political significance as well as the market significance of the commodity traders is the story of how VTOL effectively took a position in the civil war in Libya in 2011. So in 2011, uh, as you may remember, um, there was a, an uprising, a popular revolt against uh, Colonel Gaddafi in Libya. Uh, and the 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 rebels uh, had a kind of base in the east of the country around Benghazi, um, but 
as the war was going on, they weren't they were struggling. And the, the main reason they were struggling was they didn't have enough fuel, um, because although they uh, they did have some oil, they did, did control some areas of Libya that had crude oil, they didn't control the refineries. And so they didn't have enough fuel. Uh, and at that point, uh, VTOL stepped in. Uh, the CEO then of Ian, uh, of VTOL, uh, Ian Taylor, who, who since has died, uh, flew into Benghazi uh, in the middle of this civil war when you know there were bombs falling not far away uh, on a private jet and uh, and struck a deal with the Libyan rebels. You know, at that point, not internationally recognized, not a formal government in any sense of the word, uh, at, that the, the VTOL would sell them fuel and be paid uh, in exchange in crude oil. Um, but the problem very soon became that the, the rebels actually couldn't get any crude oil out of the country. And so VTOL essentially ended up financing the Libyan rebels, delivering them fuel, uh, gasoline and diesel, uh, and not being paid to the point that at some point in the middle of 2011, in the middle of the war, the Libyan rebels owed VTOL a billion dollars, um, which was a big bet uh, on, of the future of VTOL on the direction of the war. If, uh, if Gaddafi had won, then it's not very clear whether or how VTOL would ever have been paid. But they carried on delivering the fuel. Uh, you know, we spoke to people uh, who were involved in that conflict and said that made a really meaningful difference in the direction of the war. As we know, you know, Gaddafi was uh, was toppled uh, and eventually Vito was paid back. But that decision to to strike a deal, to fly into Benghazi in the middle of a, of a war, strike a deal uh, with the rebels, then extend effect effectively a loan to them of, of more than a billion dollars in the middle of a war uh, had a meaningful impact on the outcome of a war and therefore, you know, the politics of uh, of North Africa, um, you know, for the past decade. Uh, and that was done by VTOL, a private company that many people have never heard of, um, which tells you, I think, everything you know, need to know about why why Javier and I think that the commodity traders are interesting and, and, and people should learn about them. That's interesting. I'll just jump in here as co-host. And it ties into one of our first our first question from Clinton Tippett. That um, my experience has been from working for a company that did mining of uh, critical chemicals. We had ten different products, Kermadine Chemical. And they ranged from from and then we converted them into um, chemicals. A lot of them were used in industrial and some in military. And so. Um, I know what the role, the role of, of the agents and also the transnational shippers had on us as producers then, and this is a few years back, but I was just wondering, and this kind of ties with Clinton's observation about rogue um, traders, what do you think the impact is on say, let's just say lithium mining right now? What is the ultimate impact on the, the producer and also the just the world situation, for example, lithium. Well, I think, uh, I mean, I don't, this the, the 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 conversation has started with commodity traders and wrongdoing, but I would stress that I think uh, you know there's a reason why commodity traders are big and important and powerful, and it's partly because they're handling commodities that are very valuable uh, and strategic, but it's also because they're needed. It's because you know, not every company that produces lithium or oil or cocoa or, you know, every cocoa farmer in Ivory Coast uh, has the wherewithal or the desire to have a logistics operation to ship their commodity to the ultimate end buyer, a sales operation to be in touch with them in all the different places in the world where they might buy the commodity. Um, and so they're, they're, they're providing a service. Um, and more than that, they're making the market function more efficiently. They're saying, ah, there's a dislocation in the market at the moment. Uh, it's cheap in Brazil and expensive in China. So we'll ship soybeans from Brazil to China. Um, from an economic point of view, that's a, that's a good. It's making markets more efficient. Um, and I think, I mean, one thing that people ask us uh, from time to time when we do these kind of things is, you know, why don't we just get rid of the commodity traders? And I think one answer is 
it's not really possible. We need them. Uh, we need, you know, and, and unless you can, unless you can uh, find a way to make sure that every uh, producer and every consumer has a full logistics operation and a procurement or a marketing operation to to connect them to the global supply chain, um, we're going to have, have to have commodity traders, uh, and they do provide uh, an essential service um that makes markets function better and makes sure that there aren't shortages of commodities in one part of the world or another or that when there are shortages they get resolved um so when it comes to something like lithium i mean actually commodity traders aren't terribly active in lithium at the moment i mean it's not really a market that you can trade very easily at the moment although i think that is beginning to change um you know, historically, it's been a market, and maybe there are some people on this call who know who know know it better than I do. But uh, historically, it's been a market where uh, a few big producers have delivered quite uh, uh, specialized grades of chemicals to their consumers that that, that require those particular grades, um, and there hasn't been really a tradable lithium market as such. Um, that's beginning to change a bit at the moment, particularly with um uh what's called spodamine like hard rock lithium mined in uh particularly in australia which is beginning to be traded a little bit but the problem is that the lithium market is so tight at the moment that for traders to get a foothold is pretty hard um so we're beginning to see i mean we had a story on bloomberg a few weeks ago we're beginning to see some of the big trading houses trying to do things like making equity investments in miners in mines and mining projects with a view to having a trading deal where they can secure some some cargoes of lithium at some point in the future but at the moment it's not really a market that's very tradable and so the traders aren't that uh aren't that present in it well that's quite interesting and and uh so just to uh so your point that it facilitates but also is net well uh, anyway I, I won't go on anymore go ahead and to mike uh, there's a question from Fronic. I don't know if you can. There you go. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. All right, great. Let me find my thing here. So um, I work at the Kansas Geological Survey, and we've been getting a lot of funding from the federal government to search for so-called critical minerals. Um, and so these are minerals that uh, the U.S. Uh, and some of our allies rely on um, you know, uh, foreign sources that may be disrupted in the future due to political reasons, uh, namely from China and Russia. Um, and so we've been doing a lot of exploration. There's a lot of talk about opening new mines in the U.S. Do you see this as being possible in light of sort of the global mineral commodity industry of really detaching from these sources? Um, and if so, have you seen any examples of new deposits that have come online um, recently to replace these foreign sources. And I've also seen a lot of collaboration between sort of the federal levels or the national levels of the US, Canada, and Australia working on this critical mineral project. So I'm just wondering what your what your impressions on this have been. Yeah, I think it's a fascinating moment and a fascinating trend. I mean, from the kind of the zoomed out big picture level, uh, as somebody who's been writing about commodity markets and the resources industry for about 15 years now, I mean, in my career, the the trend has been Chinese the Chinese government and Chinese state owned or state backed entities and the Japanese state backed entities or big big Japanese banks and trading houses and Korean have been the big buyers and investors of natural resources around the world particularly metals and minerals um, in the past 10 20 years that I've been writing about the sector and meanwhile governments in the US, Europe have essentially stepped back and said, oh, that's, you know, that's for the private sector. That doesn't really doesn't really affect us, doesn't really involve us. Uh, and now we have this fascinating moment where that thinking has suddenly been turned on its head and they're beginning to wake up to the idea that actually, uh, particularly when you look at things like electric vehicles or solar panels, we've surrendered the entire supply chain to uh to other countries that may at some point be not be entirely friendly towards us like china i mean china is the you know I've, i mean i've been writing about this for years but china uh you know if you look at the different parts of the uh, battery supply chain 
Uh, China has done an extremely good job of building out capacity very rapidly, as they've done in other bits of uh, the commodities industry at different points in time. Uh, and now, uh, you know, the, the 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 market share of capacity for 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 various parts of the battery supply chain, particularly really the processing of the chemicals, um, is kind of 70, 80 percent and upwards is in China of things like cobalt refining, uh, lithium refining, uh, making of uh, precursors for, for battery cathodes, those kind of those kind of things. Um, although not all of the resources are in China, the processing capacity is in China. So uh, from a strategic point of view, I think uh, I think there's clearly value to having domestic production and domestic resources. I wonder if the goal really needs to be we need to mine all of our cobalt and lithium and nickel and every other metal that we need domestically, or should it be we need to have an industry that takes the whole supply chain from mine to battery and have more of that domestic and more of the expertise domestically? Um, which I think, I mean, I'm not an expert on this, but I think the Inflation Reduction Act is going some way towards trying to make that happen. Um, a colleague of mine wrote a story about uh, a lithium project in North Carolina, for example, the other day that's, uh, that's I think, coming online at some point. Um, so I think it's coming. I mean, the obvious uh, observation is if you're going to, if every country is going to e exclusively mine their own uh, their own domestic resources and not rely on uh, on the international market. It's going to make the world commodity markets or the world markets for lithium and cobalt dramatically less efficient. Because guess what? Most of the easy to mine cobalt in the world is in the Democratic Republic of Congo. It's not in the US. Um, so if that's really the goal, then it's going to make everything much much less efficient, and it's not going to be possible. I mean, I don't I don't know if there are meaningful cobalt resources in the UK, for example. I suspect not. I haven't heard of them if there are. Um, so I think it's a it's a laudable goal to 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 try and uh, stimulate more domestic production, uh, domestic mining, but also the rest of the supply chain. Um, but it also needs to be seen in reason and within the context of you're not going to get all of your uh, all of your cobalt, all of your copper entirely domestically and that's probably okay i mean the idea should be i think uh should be to have uh to not be very reliant on any one supplier i mean if you look at the lessons that we might have learned from what's happened this year in commodity markets uh it's don't be very reliant on one country to supply you your gas uh don't be germany and have that gas relationship with russia um but if you actually have 10 different suppliers, all of whom supply you with 10% of your gas, then maybe that's okay. You don't need to drill it all domestically. Um, in the US, maybe in some commodities, you're fortunate enough that that you can and you have the resources to, to supply yourself domestically, but I'm not sure it needs to be the goal. If I can just do a follow-up on, on the yeah, sure. Russian invasion of Ukraine. Have you um, seen, I've heard people say that it has disrupted certain mineral commodities Due to the sanctions on Russia, do you know what any of those mineral commodity disruptions have been, or or other things that we see that's more expensive or harder to get because of uh, that event that happened this year? Yeah, I mean, obviously the big disruption has been in energy markets, yep. which then feeds through to, to lots and lots of other things because you know aluminium, for example, is massively energy intensive, so. I think some, I think, think it's something like half of the aluminium uh, capacity in Europe has shut down this year because energy prices have gone up to such a level that it's just not uh, economic to smelt aluminium anymore. Mm. Um, something similar in zinc and in lots of other bits of industry um, where we've seen really meaningful disruptions. I mean, there are sanctions on quite a lot of different uh, bits of iron and steel from Russia. So there's a number of, um, particularly in Eastern Europe, uh companies and industries that were buying uh things like pig iron from both from Russia and Ukraine and Ukraine supplies from Ukraine have been disrupted for a different reason but have also been mm -hmm. disrupted uh and that's been quite disruptive I mean if if you're thinking of like critical minerals type thing I mean the the one that people cite always is titanium where right. Russia is a very big supplier of titanium um including to people like Boeing uh I don't believe that has been disrupted but i could be wrong um yeah. i mean in general the story of metals 
has been that while people are worried about them and while there are some companies in Europe and in the US that are uh, what has been called self-sanctioning by refusing to buy Russian uh, metal, actually, there haven't really been many sanctions that have affected the flow of Russian metal out of Russia. Uh, and for the most part, many people in or many companies in, in the West have continued to buy it and the flow has continued, even though there have been some some issues with shipping, for example, because container shipping companies, most of them have stopped calling it Russian ports. Mm. Um, and, you know, there's various various uh, logistics issues, but actually the flow has just about continued and, and companies in the West have, uh, to some degree, continued buying it. Ah, so the spice must flow. Yeah. Yeah. That's how it seems so far. I mean, there was an interesting, you know, story that I've been quite involved in covering the last couple of months is the London Metal Exchange, which is where, you know, the benchmark prices for metals are set and is the kind of key global global metals exchange had this debate about what should we do about Russian metal? Should we ban Russian metal from being delivered to our exchange? Um, because lots of people were saying either it's unethical, Russia is invading Ukraine, or actually not just that it's unethical, but uh, but enough people are not buying it that it's going to cause a distortion in the market. And the London Metal Exchange decided actually enough consumers of metal still would quite like to buy Russian metal and continue to buy Russian metal, and they decided to do nothing. Hmm. Well, thank you. That was very enlightening. Sure. We have a question from uh, Lynn George. The uh, the process of raising your hand is working out real well. So if you have a question, just raise your hand and we'll call on you. And then after your question's answered, lower your hand and then uh, we'll move on to the next question. So I believe Lynn, you can unmute and uh, activate your video if you want and go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Um... I won't activate the video, video, but I'll pose my question. Um, after you reading your book, I started reading The End of the World is Just the Beginning of the End by Peter Zahn. Zihan, um, are you familiar with that? I haven't and, read it. Either. Okay, well, could you, one of his hypotheses is, is that since the end of World War II, that basically the US Navy has provided a protective umbrella for global trade routes across oceans. And I thought you might have a comment on that, on how that enabled the commodity traders. And if you see that as a viable hypothesis. Um, I mean, it's certainly the case that there has been an extraordinary expansion in global trade. Uh, to what extent that's been enabled by the US Navy? I don't know. I'm probably not enough of a specialist on uh on shipping and uh shipping and, and and military questions. I would say I don't think that's that's the most important part of the story, I think. Uh to my mind, the most important part of the story is um uh maybe a couple of things that are connected to it. Uh one, the massive expansion of the global economy. Um, which has been facilitated by trade, but has also driven an increase in trade. Um, so particularly things like, you know, the reconstruction of Europe and Japan, the boom in Asia and in China, all of these things um, uh, have have driven a massive expansion in, in global trade uh, since, you know, over the past uh, 50 years. Uh, and... And I guess to some degree that's premised on the fact that you've had this period of peace, um, which I guess you could attribute to the US dominance of, you know, global politics and military dominance. Um, when you have a unipolar world, then uh, you might argue that uh, that 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 tends to create peace. And maybe if if now we're going into a, a more multipolar world, then that makes for less peace. Um, but if that is the thesis, have we seen massive disruption to shipping because of that? I mean, certainly out of Ukraine, but beyond that, not really, right? I mean, there's the big disruption to shipping was because of COVID uh, in in 2020, uh, and I don't think you could attribute that really to to anything to do with um, the world being a unipolar or a multipolar place. Um, so, 
Yeah, I mean, I think the, the the rise of the US and the US hegemony of, since the Second World War clearly has played a big role in uh, in the boom in in, in the global economy uh, since uh, since then, uh, which has also driven global trade. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure I know enough about uh, what the, the the security of shipping routes pre World War II to say with certainty whether I agree with that thesis or not. I'm not sure I would attribute it the prime importance. Thank you. And I have a question in the chat from Clinton Tippett, and that's uh, what role have commodity traders played in the rerouting of light national light natural gas cargoes from Far East markets to Europe in the wake of the Ukrainian situation and European supply shortages? Um, They've played a big role. I mean, it's a it's a a fascinating moment in the gas markets because uh, it is the case that if this had happened, if you know the 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 invasion of Ukraine and the shut off of Russian pipeline gas supplies to Europe had happened ten years ago, Europe would have had shortages and we would have had blackouts. And okay, we might still have blackouts. Who knows? Um, but Certainly, so far, the situation has been massively uh, improved by the fact that Europe has outbid the world for LNG, and LNG has uh, has been a, a massive swing in terms of keeping Europe Europe um, supplied with energy. Um, Ten years ago, I think the LNG market was not there and didn't wasn't big enough to do that. That you know, the, there was not a global gas market in the same way that there is today. Uh, and that has been one of the big trends in commodity markets over the last 10 years or so is the globalization of the gas market. It's gone from being very regional markets where uh, things trade around a few particular hubs like, you know, Henry Hub in the US or um, a couple of hubs in Europe uh, to a market that is global and is arbitrageable, you know, when um, at least when uh, when a few LNG projects, uh, export projects in the US have come online. Uh, this will be more true uh, when the price of Henry Hub is low enough relative to the price of gas in the in Europe. Um, you can put it on a boat and uh, and and sell it to Europe, or or vice versa. As uh, as you made the point in the question, um, you know you can redirect it from from Asia to Europe. Uh, uh, commodity traders, I think, have invested certainly a couple of a couple of the big commodity traders have invested very significantly in uh, LNG trading in the last five years or so. Um, and I think along with some of the big producers, um, they've had a very big role in doing that. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Um, with Mark Rich no longer in the picture, uh, who do you think is facilitating or, or what's facilitating the Iranian uh, oil market right now? Well, I think since sanctions, uh, a lot of the Iranian oil um, has flowed to China. Um, the, the Iranian oil that is flowing has flowed to China. Um, and there are some Chinese traders that have been doing that. I mean, we made the point uh, towards the end of the book uh, that in the world that is uh, in a world of um, dominated by the dollar and where the US has this kind of outsized role and power in financial markets thanks to the role of the dollar uh, and particularly for you know the commodity com trading companies that we write about most in the book the likes of Beetle and Glencore and Trafigura who are financed largely by global banks in dollars um, the US has a really big role and so when there are US sanctions that say you can't do this um, more or less those companies can't do it it's not worth Whatever amount of money you could possibly earn from break, breaching the sanction, sanctions is not worth it because if you breach US sanctions, you're out of business. Um, whereas there are some Chinese companies, um, possibly some companies in other jurisdictions springing up increasingly now that you have this profusion of sanctions, uh, of US sanctions around the world who are operating outside the dollar system. And, uh, and, and, and so less bothered about US sanctions. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's the that is one challenge to the commodity traders where Mark Rich, for example, was making vast amounts of money uh, shipping Iranian oil to South Africa, for example, 
uh, during the when there was a UN embargo on South Africa because of apartheid, um, that uh, that I think that kind of um, explicit uh, sanctions busting is much less of a serious option for the modern international commodity traders, um, which then opens opportunities for uh, for whoever is able and willing to do that. Thanks. You mentioned the dollar a few times in that uh, statement. Um, do you see the dollar remaining as the dominant reserve currency? Or do you think that the traders are exercising these uh, transactions in other currencies? Um, I think the dollar over time will become less uh, dominant as the global reserve currency, but I think that is going to be a really long and a really slow process. And particularly if we're talking about commodities and commodity trading, I see little sign that any commodities are being traded and priced uh, in any currency other than the dollar. And there have been lots of people for quite a number of years now in my career writing about the markets who have tried and wanted to shift commodity pricing out of dollars and they have not succeeded. Um, so I'm pretty skeptical uh, that anything can change there very rapidly. Um, there's such a, 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 you know, an inertia and a, and a critical mass of liquidity, of financing, of, um, of markets that exist already in dollars um, that I don't really see a, a, a shift out of dollar-based pricing for major commodities anytime soon. Um, and what you clearly do have, for example, you know, you're beginning to see this in with Russia now, you know, Russia-China trade or Russia-India trade might happen, might be settled in yuan or rubles or um or rupees or something else gold maybe who knows um i don't think i've don't think i know of any of examples of that but i'm sure it's a possibility um but the settlement currency being euros or rubles is a very different question from the commodity actually being priced and traded in euros or rubles and for now all of those things that they're selling are oil at x dollars a barrel which then when it comes to settlement, they work out the exchange rate and transfer the right number of euros or rubles. Um, so it's not really a shift away from dollar pricing for commodities yet. And I don't I don't see much sign that that's going to happen anytime soon. Thank you. Susan, do you have a question? Yes. Okay, so um, I had kind of two that are related, but um, can co commodity traders overcome some of the market and supply manipulation that is occurring due to the Belt and Road initiatives? And then kind of related to that, is there room in the commodity traders world for new commodity traders? For example, can producers, are, and I'm thinking of critical minerals, <laughs> can they, enter that commodity the commodity traders world and, and be their own trader um okay uh so the first question i, mean, I think the belt and road is really part of the trend that uh that i was identifying earlier talking about you know the inflation reduction act and critical minerals and 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 how governments think about commodities the belt and road is part of china using its state might and particularly financial might to further Chinese interests in countries around the world. Um, and that obviously goes far beyond commodities uh, in, its, in its reach. And lots of it is things like uh, logistics and, uh, and transport and that kind of thing. But it's also a commodities, it's also part of their investment in commodities uh, beyond China. And it's something that, which is something that definitely predates the, the existence of the Belt and Road Initiative as a, as a thing. And, uh, I mean, it's. I think the level of excitement both outside of China and within China about Belt and Road as a concept seems to have quieted down quite a lot recently. But I don't think that really 
tells you very much about uh, about whether China is going to invest less uh, internationally. I think it was a, you know, uh, it was a concept that it was or it was a it was a it was a catchword uh, that or catchphrase that was that was popular uh, for a little while, but um, but the trend has clearly been for China to use uh it's the 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 financial um might of its of the state to to further its foreign policy objectives around the world including by investing in natural resources and i don't see that changing anytime soon um your second question on new commodity traders i think the barrier to entry to be uh as to, to start up a commodity trader from zero has grown a lot in the last 10 or 20 years um, both in terms of financial, you know, to be able to trade in some markets, you need quite a lot of money now because um, uh, markets are bigger and prices are higher. Uh, banks, I think, are much less willing to lend to uh, one guy because they know him uh, on the strength of being mates or something. Uh, you need to have a whole setup with, you know, financial accounting, compliance, all the rest of it, in order to get uh, financing from, from major banks. So starting up uh, from zero is hard, but to answer your point about whether big producers could get into commodity trading, they certainly can, and they are. Um, I mean, there are some big producers that are very major commodity traders. So for example, in the, in the oil markets, uh, BP, Shell, and Total, are three of the largest commodity traders uh, over and above the amount of oil that they actually produce from their own fields or their own refineries. Um, they are large commodity traders and extremely profitable commodity traders in their own right and in the gas markets. Um, and that's clearly, you clearly have a natural advantage as a, as a producer because you're already in the market, you're already producing something. So half of the, half of the challenge is already, you already, is already done. Um, I think the difficulty as a producer trying to become a commodity trader, and we've seen some examples of this in the last, I don't know, 10 years or so, where some producers have tried to get into commodity trading um, and then have have, have walked it back again, um, is, is, is a kind of cultural thing. You know, if you're trading commodities, sometimes you make lots of money and sometimes also you lose money. And... Uh, unless you really are willing to do that as a producer and to see uh, your commodity trading desk lose a load of the company's money, um, it's quite hard to give them the freedom to make the money. Um, another difficulty is how much you need to pay people. I mean, people, commodity traders in the likes of Glencore and Vito and Trafagura, but also hedge funds and banks earn an awful lot of money. Um, and inside some producers, who are not used to employing commodity traders, they simply can't get their heads around needing to pay a trader more than the CEO. I mean, in BP, for example, there's, uh, there's I think every year in the last 20 but one, uh, there have been about a dozen, a dozen oil traders um, and probably some gas traders recently who have made more money than the CEO. Um, and in fact, there's a little list that goes up uh, to the CEO each year to approve of people who's whose overall pay and bonus is going to be higher than, than the CEOs because that's what you need to pay in order to retain the top people in commodity trading for, for better or for worse. That's the way the, the industry is. And you, they, the, if you're a good commodity trader, you can go and make a lot of money somewhere else. Um, and I think a lot of producers, uh, or certainly some producers that have tried to get into commodity trading have stumbled on those kind of things because they're not willing to pay for the best talent and also because they don't understand the risks inherent in commodity trading. And so they're not willing to, you know, they're not willing to see people make significant losses. Well, I want to point out you can also lose a lot. So there's exactly there's that. Thank you. I have a question from Dan Billman, and that's what are your thoughts on the Jones Act? And is the United States san sanctioning itself and that it cannot easily ship like natural gas? from the US natural gas markets to the areas in need of natural gas, like the Northeastern US? Um, uh, yes, in short. <laughs> um, 
uh, you know, in the end, I mean, I, I I made the point earlier for for all of the good and the bad of commodity traders. I think you know one thing that you you can't take away from them is that they are in the business of making markets work more efficiently. Um, you know, taking seeing where prices are high and delivering commodities to those places, seeing where prices are low and buying commodities in those places. Uh, and at those moments in time, uh, you know, if you if you put in place laws, rules, regulations that inhibit that process, you make markets less efficient. Um, and the Jones Act is something that does that. Um, you know, you can't you can't take a take a as you say you can't uh, you can't easily take a cargo of LNG and deliver it to the northeast. Uh, you can't do you know similarly with um, with oil. Uh, you need to have a, a U.S. flag vessel, and and maybe that's not available. So yeah, that makes the market a bit less efficient. Uh, obviously, there are political reasons for it. Um, probably as a as a Brit, I'm I shouldn't comment on them. Uh, but but yeah, I mean, I think it's it's hard to argue that it and it, that it does anything other than make the market less efficient. Thank you. Uh, this is from Clinton Tippett. Do you have any examples of companies that have played with commodities on a speculative basis and have been badly burned or had incidents where uh, they've had to withdraw in, in a serious situation? Uh, yes, lots. Um, I mean, there are plenty of examples of, um, of hedge funds in commodities that have done very well one year and then blown up the next. Um, I mean, a famous one that, that you guys in the US uh, energy markets might be familiar with is Amaranth um, that blew up on uh, on the Widowmaker gas spread in um, oh gosh 2006 was it I'm not sure anyway uh, so there's like there's a good there's some good numbers of examples of of hedge funds that have blown up but also um, also uh, commodity producers and commodity traders. Um, one from the history books is Metallgesellschaft, which uh, was, you know, historically one of the early metal traders in Germany in the 19th century, but then also got into oil. And uh, in the early 1990s, they lost more than a billion dollars trading oil. Um, I mean, there's some arguments about whether it was a, 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 a speculative trade or a hedge gone wrong, but they lost an awful lot of money. Um, uh, I mean, more more recently, you could look at what's happened in the nickel market this year um, with uh, with Tsingshan, which is the world's largest nickel producer, uh, had a big short position, a big bet on lower prices on the London Metal Exchange uh, and couldn't afford to hold it once prices started going up and got squeezed terribly and was in a position where they were going to lose uh, more than $10 billion until the LME cancelled, suspended the market and cancelled a load of trades. Um, which again is an example. Well, they ended up not losing very much money because the LME did suspend the market and cancel the trades. But it's an example of uh, of a company uh, trading commodities and almost losing a lot of money. Thank you, uh, Steve Badcock has a question. Oh, I guess I could read it out loud. Okay, <laughs> no, I. <clears throat> All of this is well and good, but again, you know, I, I, I tend to lean towards actionable information and, you know, awareness, great, you know, journalism, awesome. Thank you guys. You do great work. But what can we do? Okay. And particularly, what can we do as professional societies that are involved in resource extractions to create a more prosperous future for all of us? Ooh. Well, that's a big question, um, and there's lots of different answers, I think. Um, I mean, I think the first thing we can do is think about our own consumption. Uh, we can think about our own consumption when it comes to what resources we're using, uh, how carbon intensive they are, and that kind of thing. You know, should you do you need to take as many flights as? as you do take do you need to heat your house to which whatever temperature you heat your house to and could, or could you save some energy doing something else i mean you know something that i um despair about sometimes here in the uk although i'm happy to see that uh, the uk government actually did start uh saying they're going to do something about it this week 
uh, is insulation. The UK has some of the worst housing stock in the world in terms of insulation. And we lose an awful lot of energy every year through simply not having very well insulated houses. Um, and a lot of the, the stock that is not well insulated is in uh, is in either is owned by uh, by local government or is uh, in the rental uh, in the rental market, and there hasn't been a big incentive on people to on the owners of it to, to insulate it. Um, I mean, the other thing that one can do as a consumer, I think, is be conscious about where the things you're consuming come from. Uh, I mean, something that I have found frustrating as a journalist. You know, we write about uh, sometimes about um bad things going on in the resources industry uh and uh and then you see so for example i'm um, the, the 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 story i'm thinking of which you guys might remember uh is the story of um of child labor in the in the congo cobalt sector uh which was um became a big story a couple a few years ago uh you know in in, in congo you have lots of what's called artisanal miners uh which essentially means large groups of uh of villagers going and mining by hand uh and selling the rocks that they ship out to to middlemen who then sell them onto the global market uh and you know in many cases many of those people are not using any safety equipment at all some of them are children etc 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 um there was a big outcry about it but actually when you uh i found you know looking at who who continued to buy uh who continued to buy the cobalt that was being mined in questionable ways by you know uh by artisanal miners without any safety equipment equipment uh, and where it was going often it's going into the the consumer goods that we all use and when you drill down into why you know, uh, a Western company is willing to buy from a um, from a I don't know, you know, refinery or a battery maker that doesn't particularly uh, try very hard to eliminate uh, child labour, for example, from its supply chain. Well, the answer is that their end consumers, us, the people buying their phones or electric vehicles or uh, computers or whatever it might be don't really care that much about it. Um, I mean, there's something a bit similar at the moment. Um, uh, you know, a lot of the new nickel supply in the world comes from, is coming at the moment from Indonesia. Uh, Indonesian nickel is produced, a lot of it, using very dirty coal power. Uh, it's very carbon intensive. Um, but a lot of the people buy, ultimately who are buying that nickel is Western car companies um putting it in batteries for electric vehicles and and ultimately you and me uh and 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 there's not really an outrage among consumers about it so i think you know being conscious as a consumer of what you're consuming is one thing you can do um as a professional in the industry try to be moral uh and do the right thing um uh, you know, reading, for example, some of the we started the conversation talking about Glencore's fines for 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 corruption and what they were doing in Africa. I mean, reading some of the accounts of what people were doing, it's very clear. You know, there was no grey area. They were picking up uh, thousands of of uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars or euros in cash, ferrying them across the world and delivering them to government officials in bribes. You know, don't do that. <laughs> All right, thanks. We have a question from uh, Kirkwood. You'll have to unmute. Go ahead. Okay. I, I was wondering if you could reflect a little bit on um, uh, what uh, capacity some of these foreign governments might have in uh, the manipulation of a price um, you know, for instance, did, did the, the Saudis or the Russians have, uh, um, you know, go short the oil price before they uh, declared the, the oil price war? And then in the United States here, since our Congress is exempt from, from insider trading, um, you know, just the, the whole gamut of 
of uh, the government's uh, manipulation of commodity prices. Um, well, of course, uh, there's there's not really such a thing as insider trading in commodity markets. I mean, one of the one of the theses of of the book is that commodity markets are uh, and particularly physical commodity markets um, are could do with a lot more regulation um, and a lot more oversight by regulators. Um, and you know, one one area of that. I mean, there are in some parts of the world, for example, in Europe, if there are now some laws that uh, go some way to making uh, insider trading in commodities uh, illegal. Um, but they're not very well defined or tested out, and I'm not sure that we've seen many examples, if any, of uh, of prosecution of anyone who has done, for example, you know, trading ahead of announcing a production cut or production increase. Um, uh, if you talk about governments manipulating, I mean, in general, I think my view on market manipulation is uh, there definitely is. Um, uh manipulation and we've seen examples of manipulation in all kinds of commodity markets over history um by governments but also by companies and individuals it's very hard for anyone to manipulate the market for very long um markets you know high prices solve high prices uh they reduce consumption and increase production uh and bring back markets to where they where they ought to be um it's hard for anyone to to manipulate markets over a very long period of time in any particular direction. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if if I answered all of your question. Was that? There you go. Oh, you're muted. Thank you. Okay. It's Getting right, well, we're just past 11 o'clock, so I didn't want to keep you any longer, Jack. Uh, thank you so much for being here. I did want to, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't put in a plug for the Energy Minerals Division of AAPG. And uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, Susan, you did have a, a comment in the chat that I'll, that I'll make here uh, and then get your answer and see what you think. Uh, did you want to ask that question, Susan? Um, well, I was just, uh, first of all, I wanted to say that this has been fantastic and thank you for the questions that to everybody who participated, but especially to you, um, Jack, for, for such an incredible dis discussion and one that opened up so many areas. And I just wonder if it's possible to have professional societies that can contribute to a database of leads or what they observe, et cetera, kind of citizen reporting that is really, really maybe complementary to what you are doing, Jack, in terms of, of investigative journalism so that they can perhaps, we can work together and, and create transparency or more transparency. Uh, yeah, I think that would be, uh, that would be probably be very, um, be very desirable. I mean, I can think of a few examples of people trying to do things a bit like that. I mean, just one example I'll give you briefly, uh, which is in, in commodity trade finance, where there have been over the last few years, a series of frauds, where it's an industry where banks finance um, commodity trade largely on the basis of pieces of paper. And of course, the pieces of paper can be uh can be duplicated and and you know passed off the same piece of paper the same bill of lading as, as it's called uh to several banks and borrow against it several times uh and one thing that people are trying to do is create a database where you say okay this cargo has been and this bill of lading is financed by me and all the banks can go and check it against each other and say okay that's financed by that that by that bank so if somebody's coming to me and trying to finance it again with me there must be a fraud somewhere here um, that's a very simple thing, which seems to me extremely obvious and probably should have happened a long, long time ago. And I don't really understand why it hasn't, but there you go. Uh, so yes, I think there's a, there's, there's lots of scope for that. And also things like ownership of some of these, like it tends to shift around and, and there are companies that are, um, potentially front companies, just making them a little bit more transparent. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, and that, and that it's, it's beginning to happen. I mean, it's beginning to happen, but the issue is there are so many different jurisdictions in the world and all you need to have is one jurisdiction that allows people to to not disclose their ownership and and not uh, and not be transparent then and then it's it's a kind of lowest common denominator question well thank you this is wonderful thank you it's been a pleasure one last question do you think that the accountability will come in the form of blockchain or is that something that's sort of out of your no i mean i think uh without being in any way an expert on it my impression from talking to people who are more expert than me is it can be a very useful tool for example the kind of thing i was just talking about uh where you have a database of who's financed which cargo and uh and which bill of lading is uh is being used as security for which bank that's exactly the kind of thing that a blockchain potentially could be useful for um does it have to be on a blockchain I don't know. I'm not. Uh, I'm not uh, a software engineer, and I don't know if there's another solution to that that wouldn't require a blockchain, or whether a blockchain is the perfect solution for it. Um, from talking to uh, clever people who know more about it than I do, it's, it sounds like there are. That is the kind of the use case for for, for blockchain, and I think some people, some of the those kind of projects are indeed happening on blockchains, from what I understand. Thank you. And again, for everybody that's here, this is uh, Jack Farchi, and he is a co-author with Javier Blaise, and he wrote The World for Sale, uh, Money, Power, and the Traders Who Barter the Earth's Resources. It's an amazing book. If you get a chance, pick it up if you haven't read it already, or if you're like me, listen to it. And uh, with that, I will, I don't know if you have any parting comments, Jack, but I do appreciate you being here, and thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. And thanks for all your uh, your questions and your attention. I appreciate it. And yes, the book is on Amazon to whoever was asking that. It's an amazing book. Thank you so much. Uh, with that, I will end the meeting and everybody have a good day or night. Thank you.